Hello, and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us for today's Select Science webinar entitled Pharmaceutical Impurity Profiling, Simple Confident Analysis with New GCMS Technology. My name is Lois Mantino byrne and I will be moderating today's presentation. I am delighted to introduce our speakers today, Natalie Sanderson and Kyle De Silva. Natalie is an analytical scientist at AstraZeneca and has worked across several analytical projects specializing in gas chromatography mass spectrometry. Kyle is a senior pharma and biopharma marketing manager at Thermo Fisher Scientific and specializes in connected solutions for pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical workflows. Today's webinar will focus on the profiling of a API and product intermediate impurities using the latest GCMS technology. Just before I hand over to Natalie and Kyle, I would like to mention a couple of things. Please feel free to ask, ask any questions for the Q&A session at any time during the webinar by clicking on the Ask a Question button at the bottom of your screen. You can view the presentation in full screen by clicking on the tab at the bottom right of the media window player, and you can access relevant documents and application notes in the resources tab at the bottom of your screen. You will also be able to download a copy, a PDF copy of the slides of after the webinar. The on-demand link will also be provided in a few days' time. Without further, further delay, I would like to hand over to Kyle and Natalie, and I would like to thank them for presenting to us today. Please go ahead, Kyle. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Lois. So as Lois already mentioned, today's uh, webinar will focus on pharmaceutical impurity profiling with uh, a brand new GCMS technology. At the end of today's presentation, we want you to leave with, with three main takeaways. The first is uh, an overview of this new technology for confident identification of unknown impurities. We're going to show you the new features, benefits, and capabilities of this system. And finally, I will pass to Natalie Sanderson who will demonstrate the pharmaceutical impurity profiling workflow with real-world samples that have been analyzed uh, on behalf of AstraZeneca. So when we take a look at the world of pharmaceutical impurities, the compounds of, of interest comprise a very wide range of different chemical moieties, from volatile organic impurities to non-volatile organics and even elemental impurities. Today's presentation really takes a look at, at one subsection of, of semi-volatile impurities. So in general, these have conventionally been analyzed by gas chromatography, hyphenated to mass spectrometry. But more and more popular today is high-resolution mass spectrometry, because this provides an added dynamic of confidence in the unambiguous identification of unknowns. Generally, workflows involve electron ionization and chemical ionization. So the substructure analysis can be performed through fragment fingerprinting of each, of each molecule. Library searches are, are generally used as well as uh, accurate mass elemental composition for confident substructural analysis. Generally, there are several components for, for confident identification of unknowns. Retention time, in comparison to known standards, um, is one dynamic. Mass spectral information provides another. High resolution, accurate mass spectrometry gives uh, an additional dynamic of, of confidence for the uh, identification of empirical formulae. By having absolute confidence in mass accuracy, you can really eliminate um, potential potential empirical formulae and, and perform unambiguous, uh, unambiguous identification of unknowns. In addition, structural analysis as well as substructural analysis um, is often performed, such as, as MS, MS um, for, for added confidence in, in the substructure of certain ions. Finally, library searches can add additional information, such as name and cast number. And generally, most clients wish to perform a quantitative analysis um, during the same, same run so that they can calculate the amount of impurity. So the new technology we're introducing today is the thermoscientific Q-exactive GC, quadrupole orbitrap GC and SMS system. 
The system was introduced at the um, American Society of Mass Spectrometry um, this summer. Uh, and for the first time here today, we're showing its use for pharmaceutical impurity analysis. The system comprises of three proven and um, robust technologies. The first technology is our popular Trace 1300 series GC. It is a truly modular GC that allows plug and play of a wide variety of different injection um, techniques, as well as plug and play of different um, gas handling systems, such as helium, helium um, reduction systems. Behind the the Trace 1300 GC, we have our TSQ 8000 series extractor by iron source technology. This is an iron source that we're incredibly proud of. The source was developed for the rigors of ultra trace quantification of environmental samples, extremely dirty samples, and very low level um, concentration analytes. So, this source was developed for um, uninterrupted use of, of dirty matrices for uh, protracted periods of time, weeks rather than days. And we're very proud of it, and that's why we've included it within this system. And then finally, we, we have behind the iron source our extremely popular um, Orbitramp mass technology. It, it provides incredible high-resolution, accurate mass performance. Let me take a look at the inside of the instrument. We have our iron source on the right hand side, and behind that we have a bent flasher pole to ensure that no um, no neutral molecules are, are transport, transferred further down into the mass analyzer. We have a resolving um, advanced quadrupole technology quadrupole, and then behind that we have our C trap. So the C trap stores ions for injection into our high resolution accurate mass or the trap mass analyzer. We're also able to perform an elegant dance of ions from the seed trap into a HCD cell and then back into the orbit trap mass analyzer to perform um, advanced fragmentation or MS to the N type experiments. So what does that power really bring you? The system is capable of achieving resolution up to 120,000, a mass of 200, 200 uh, Daltons. What does that mean in practice? It means that you're able to achieve incredibly clean spectra. So the isobaric interferences can be resolved, but do not belong to the compound of interest, and that library searches are simplified because the spectra are so clean. Mass accuracy is achievable down to sub 1 ppm mass accuracy on every single scan across every single analysis. So unlike uh, other instrument manufacturers that, that may have to average across an analyte peak um, to perform a, a mass accuracy experiment, we're able to see sub 1 ppm on every scan all the time. This means that you are able to perform true unambiguous identification. Um, of unknowns. The performance in terms of sensitivity we define as quadrupole grade uh, quantification performance. So we're able to quantify down at low PPT levels right the way up to high nanogram levels across six orders of linear dynamic range. But this is not in a selected iron mode, this is in full scan. All of the data, all of the time, and you're still able to achieve that exceptional quantification performance. Let's take a look at some of the results. So this is a, 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 an analytical impurity of ethyl octane away. Very early leaking compound, low molecular weight. And what's labeled on every scan is the PPM mass accuracy. So generally, um, mass spectrometry vendors at low molecular weights will report the results rather in millidalton mass error rather than PPM. And here we can see that actually the PPM mass error is sub 1 PPM consistently on every scan. Uh, this is data required at 60,000 resolution, and we're able to comfortably achieve in excess of 18 data points across the peak. So we have more than sufficient uh, acquisition rate performance for, for GC mass spectrometry. 
One point to note is, I don't know whether the resolution on the webcast is sufficient for everybody to see, but if you take a zoom in um, on each of the data points, the only the fifth decimal place um, varies from scan to scan. So this, this high resolution and mass accuracy is supplemented by exceptional um, performance and sensitivity. We have a system suitability test that we believe can be performed on every instrument. And uh, we are able to test the system on very low levels, 10 centigrams of octafor and aptaline on column. Um, because of the exceptional resolution uh, from the system, we don't really see any noise. So we, we define our system's um, uh, analytical performance based on a, on a statistical evaluation of data, of replicates of data, and we believe that the detection limit for most analytes would be in the very low femtogram level, and in this case for to fluorin aptaline it's two femtograms. That sensitivity is supported by exceptional um, uh, linearity across six orders of dynamic range. So here we see the same compound analyzed from 10 femtograms up to 10 nanograms injected on column. What does this give you in practice? Well, in, in reality, most high resolution mass spectrometry systems, generally TOF based systems, would see some saturation of the ADC or TDC detector at those high concentrations. And that would re would require either a dilution and re-injection to perform a quantitative estimate or a, a subsequent analysis. Here, what we're able to achieve is identification and quantification of the lowest peaks um, with very high concentration peaks analyzed at the same time at the high nanogram level. Moreover, when we take a look at the mass error across this, this large six orders of dynamic range, we consistently see sub 1 ppm mass error. Now, this is not, not averaged across the scan. We see this on every single data point uh, across the chromatographic peak. So that type of performance uh, generally would require some kind of specialism in terms to, to operate the instrument and acquire the data. We work very, very hard on the system to, to um, eliminate the requirement for, for a significant degree of experience to, to generate this data. We try to automate um, uh, setup routines where possible. So we have a, an automated auto-tune and setup um, process. It's just a few clicks. It provides a simple status, automated loop checking of the system, and then automated tuning and calibration. And this can be performed every day, but we tend to see that it's stable for, for a number of days, if not longer. And the whole process takes only a few minutes. So once we've acquired the data, um, this type of exceptionally rich data requires advanced software tools. Um, behind it for you to perform a, a, an evaluation. So Thermo Fisher Scientific has a range of, of advanced um, tools for the uh, advanced unknown identification workflows. We have our compound discoverer tool that plugs into it um, a series of different components depending on whether you're performing differential analysis or whether you would like to compare against um, proprietary libraries, such as our high-resolution accurate mass libraries, cloud-based libraries, such as the very popular NZ Cloud um, high-resolution mass spectral library that's free to search um, and uh, evaluate data online, or plug in um, components such as our mass, mass frontier spectral interpretation software. All of these, these components can plug in to each other, dependent on your exact analytical workflow. So today I'm going to talk just about one of those workflows, which is belonging to our thermoscientific trace finder software. So this is a very simple software that has very advanced capabilities. It's designed for routine evaluation, both qualitative and quantitative um, of, of high resolution mass spectral data. So TraceFinder 
um, incorporates a plugin for DCMS. And the peak detection algorithm has been specifically optimized for the very narrow peaks that are uh, generated from gas chromatography, but also for the rich mass spectral data and fragments that are generated by GCMS. So the system performs an accurate mass deconvolution. It doesn't perform a nominal mass, unlike other, other um, software programs. It actually extracts every mass to a very narrow um, mass tolerance. It will then create an exceptionally clean spectrum to library search and then um, perform an added degree of, of confident identification using accurate mass filtering. What we do is we, we don't just identify the compound based on its uh, pseudo-molecular ion and mass accuracy of the pseudo-molecular ion. The exceptional mass accuracy of the orbitrap based mass spectrometer allows you to perform um, high resolution filtering based on all of the ions in the, in the clean spectrum. So what we do is with a, a HRF, high resolution filtering algorithm, we look at all of the ions in the identified um, spectrum and we see what proportion of those ions can be explained by the proposed empirical formula, and what proportion of those ions that are observed that cannot be explained by the uh, proposed empirical formula. And we, we um, from that we generate a, a single HRF score, and that score helps you to provide an additional dynamic and confidence of the ID. So let's take a look at an example workflow using using uh, TraceFinder. Generally, customers are wanting to compare some form of blank or control against the sample. So here we have a, an example where we have a, a blank control. It contains a number of peaks that could be from, from solvent or, or during the um, extraction process that we, we are not so interested in because they don't belong to the sample of interest. So the software will allow you to compare one um, sample or a batch of samples, replica analyses, to a control or a batch of, of um, controls. So TraceFinder first performs an accurate mass deconvolution, extracts all the ions um, uh, from, the, from the chromatogram that have the same retention time, and then provides a nice clean spectrum for library matching. Next, it gives a very simple overview of the data. It heat maps the data and shows you peaks that really are just elevated within the sample of interest so that you can very easily, both quantitatively and qualitatively, see the peaks that are, uh, or impurity peaks that are elevated within, within the sample of interest. You're able to rank those samples based on fold difference between a, a control and, and the sample so that you can very easily review data based on the, the relative intensity. And finally, the, the clean spectrum is submitted to a, a library search. Now, this could be an in-house library. It could be the online library, such as NZ Cloud that I've already referred to, or, or it could be a proprietary library. Here, for an example, we use NIST. So we perform a library search, and that library search returns a search index that you can see in the middle of the screen, the SI score. We also combine that with our high resolution filtering HRS score value. So in this particular example, we can see two um, proposed formulae um, on line one and three that have very similar search index scores. But when looking at all of the ions within the spectrum, and we can see that only one of those formulae could have a large proportion of the ions explained by the exact mass empirical um, uh, elemental composition of each one of the ions. So the combination of the search index and the high resolution filtering score provides one overall high confidence score for, for the um, formulae. And we can see that this particular formula is returned with an exceptionally high degree of confidence is the 18H3002. So we can see that all of the fragments from a 
molecular ion and pseudo molecular ion are, are returned with a high degree of mass accuracy. We are able as well to um, supplement that mass accuracy with different ionization modes. And this is especially important if you're trying to identify the elemental composition or structure of an unknown without a library gate. So in this case, we, we have returned a, a poor result for uh, uh, an unknown analyte. So we very quickly are able to switch from electron ionization to chemical ionization in under two minutes um, without venting of the source. And you're very, very quickly up and running. Um, there is no requirement to vent the source to change columns or to to remove the inner source volume and switch between EI and CI. What that allows us to do is to take any iron from the, from the um, uh, observed electron impact spectrum and we can then perform uh, an MSMS experiment. And we can do this in an automated fashion by taking a, a top three data dependent um, analysis mode or um, by directing the instrument to a particular iron of interest to perform NSMS on. So here we can see a, a comparison of the electron impact and um, electron ionization spectrum and the positive chemical ionization spectrum where the, the molecular ion is, is confirmed um, in CI with two different uh, adduct clusters. So what we're able to do, this shows the molecular ion that's been analyzed in CI, and then we performed a fragment ion experiment. And we can see each one of those fragments is again explained with a very high degree of mass accuracy um, by the proposed empirical formula. So I believe we have a poll question now. Thanks, Kyle. So the poll question during this presentation is, how many empirical formula results are returned for mass 324.13541 when using a 5 ppm mass window and standard element constraints? constraints? A, 1, B, 12, C six. So how many empirical formula results are returned for mass three two four point one three five four one when using a five ppm mass window and standard element constraints? A one, B twelve, or C six. Okay, Kyle, try to quickly go through the answers. So we've got the poll results here, and um, we can see that 80% answered B, so 12, and um, sorry, 46% uh, answered 12, 23% um, answered A1, and 30% and answered C, so 6. Back over to you, Kyle. Thank you, Lois. So we can actually see when we when we look at that that data that's analysed, um, when we use constraints of five ppm mass uh, um, mass windows to perform the elemental composition, six results. So the correct answer actually was the C six. That I'm pleased to see that that almost half of the attendees got right. Um, but this is really just to show that that mass um, accuracy here really does lead to um, only one unambiguous identification when you apply exceptionally low tolerances and mass accuracy. So by applying the window of, of plus or minus one ppm, you're able to return um, only one result from your elemental composition evaluation. And I'm confident to say that only the Orbitrap based high resolution accurate mass technology that's used on the QXACT GC has this capability. So 
Okay, so just to summarize, we have a new QExactive GC that comes with all the chart based high resolution accurate mass technology and it does really enable a new dynamic and confidence for the identification of unknown impurities. It's very simple to use and it's very um, robust hardware that allows both quantitative analysis and qualitative analysis in a single run without requiring dilutions of um, concentrated uh, impurity analysis um, samples. And more information can be found about the, the instrument at thermoscientific.com forward slash QExactive GC. And with that, I'd like to pass on to Natalie Sanderson from AstraZeneca. Thanks very much, Carl. Um, so today I'm going to have um, I'm going to talk to you about the applicability of the Thermo Scientific Q Executive GC system in support of pharmaceutical research and development and the things we kind of do here at AstraZeneca. So here I've got a quick overview of the areas that I'm going to be covering today. Uh, and we're going to be looking at the advantages in a quick system setup, uh, the benefits of ID with high mass accuracy, um, potential uses of CI when EI isn't an option. We're going to be looking at the scan speeds. I know Kyle's shown you a little bit of this already, but we're going to go and show you our examples too. Uh, and we've looked at linearity of the system as well for quantitative analysis. Um, this will be followed by impurity detection and a case study as well. So GCMS is a fundamental tool in identifying and quantifying impurities. Um, so we use it over a range of materials here at AstraZeneca. So whether it's a, a new starting material, a reaction mixture, um, we use impurity tracking throughout our drug design pro uh, processes. And um, we look at impurities within our active pharmaceutical ingredients, which are our APIs. And um, such knowledge is essential uh, for patient safety, which is at the foremost of what we do here. We look at process understanding and route design as well. So anything we can do to help make the route better, we try and do. So we're going to aim to assess the QExactive GC system for its ability to support us here. And for this, a range of pharmaceutically relevant samples have been investigated. So our first um, look at the instrument would be the initial setup. So walking up to the instrument, how do we get it going? Um, so a tuning calibration itself takes less than five minutes total. So you do a quick tune up, quick calibration, and you're good to go. And because it's so quick, you can do it every day, and it doesn't take any time away from your analysis. Um, we have a multi-purpose sampler as well on the instrument, which is the bar you can see above the GC. Um, and so this does automated uh, head changes. So whether you want to change from a liquid injection to a headspace injection, this can all do it for you and it's programmed in. You can even do head changes uh, through your sequence. If you program it into your sequence page, it will do, do it for you. Um, this also al allows online derivatization as well. Um, column change can also occur without venting the mass spec. Um, so the amount of time you spent venting your mass spec, then you change your source and then pump down the system again, that's all gone. So it's quick and easy. You can swap your system and go. So these are all examples of the system usability. And so this has high advantage over other systems that actually may take a few hours to then get up and going again. So the first experiment we, experiment we looked at was to look at the MAC accuracy results that we got, looking at five typical low molecular weight compounds. So we used the, uh, electron ionization to look at these. So high mass accuracy increases confidence in structural characterization, and usually one elemental formula can be identified. So if we have a quick look at the results, these five compounds have been identified by, uh, from their elemental formula. Um, each of these has a less than 0 0.9 parts per million accuracy for each. Um, so it's across the board, being able to identify them with such a high mass accuracy, it, it gives you the confidence and this is what we are looking at.
So if we move on to look at chemical ionization, I know Kyle's already said a bit about changing the source. Um, but for someone like me who's never used this system before to be able to walk up, and I, c I could change the source in two minutes. Um, so it's another usability advantage of the system that I can swap from EI to CI in a matter of minutes, do a quick tune and calibration, and I can carry on with my analysis again. Um, so the aim of this section was to perform chemical ionization on the same five low molecular weight compounds we've just looked at. Um, and just to note, the chemical ionization gas we've used here is methane. Um, so these are our results here. Um, so the data shows a comparison between the chemical ionization and the electron ionization um, for 3S methylmorphine, so the compound in the top corner. Um, you can see that the M plus H peak has been identified, and it has a less than 1 ppm accuracy. So again, it confirms that this is what we're looking at. And here we can see the advantages of using chemical ionization. So the top vector gives uh, a clear molecular ion shown. And I know we can see it in the electron ionization vector too, but maybe it's not as, as predominant. Um, but we see this again later with some other examples. Uh, so here are the results from all five compounds together. Uh, and you can see the results, uh, theoretical results that we'd expect and the measured results we got. Uh, and from that, we've um, calculated the mass accuracy again. And you can see that it's less than 0.5 part per million for each, um, which is, is quite amazing. So it shows the high accuracy again in CI as well which is a high advantage for those that don't ionize under electron ionization. So historically, Orbitrap systems have not been known maybe not to be as quick as TOS systems in the scan speed range. Um, because of this, we wanted to assess this further um, in how we, we want the quick speed capability. Um, so for quantitative analysis, ideally we kind of need 10 scans um, for an idealized peak shape and for a pure result at the end. Um, so for this, we're going to look at four fluorobenzonitrile, um, which has a peak width of 3.6 seconds. So here we see um, the same compound, the same peak, over a range of resolving powers. And um, just note these are all at N over Z200. And so you can see the scans range. So at A, which is 15,000 resolving power, we've got about 25 scans there. Um, at B, we have about 20 scans. C, which is 60,000, has about 15 scans there. And at 120,000, we've still got 11 scans. So this is still high enough for us to produce the idealized peak shape that we're looking for. So usually, um, a resolving power of 60,000 will be used for general analysis. So we're going to zoom on that on our next slide. So here we show the mass accuracy for each of those scans. Um, so across the peak there, you can see that all of, all of the scans have less than one part per million accuracy. Um, so it allows identification of an impurity, not necessarily by averaging across a peak, but from one individual scan. Um, so the resolution as well is also um, annotated in red at the top of the peak as well for those that, want, uh, for those that are interested. And next we moved on to looking at linearity. Um, the linearity of 4-fluorobenzonitrile was assessed over a range of concentration. So this is to look into the quantification side of things. Um, an electron ionization experiment was taking place, and we used the extracted iron of M over Z121 with a mass window of plus or minus 2 ppm either side. And so here we have our linearity results with the area um, plotted against the concentration. So we've produced an R-square value of 0.9971. 
Um, in-house here at AstraZeneca, for a linearity experiment, we would have to have a greater than 0.99 um, R squared value to meet our internal specification. And this, this experiment here has done that. So it's an advantage to us that this is so clear and easy to do. Um, to also note, for each concentration, the mass accuracy here was less than 0.7 ppm. Okay, um, so next uh, I've got a section on impurity detection. And impurity detection is vital within the pharmaceutical industry. Um, with high mass accuracy being a huge advantage when it comes to looking at unknown uh, impurities. Um, with aid of library searches and things like that, matching to impurities becomes possible. So here we're looking at 3S methyl morpholine. And we want to do a full characterization like we would here if, if something like this came in. Um, it could be a typical starting material. It's something that we would typically look at here. Um, and just to point out, so the first yellow section that has been highlighted, there is a peak on the, on the tail of the main peak. Uh, and I'm going to show you some results about that too. Um, so here we've got the uh, detected impurities, which have been identified both in chemical ionization and electron ionization, um, each with a mass accuracy of less than 0.7 ppm. And so the second impurity you can see is the one that's on the tail of the main peak. So even though it is hidden in the tail of the methyl morpholine, we still get a very good and high mass accuracy of the separation there. Um, so one elemental formula has been proposed for these structures, and from this we have identified the structures from there. So looking on a, a bit of a case study, I suppose, um, we've analyzed a diamine sample, which was a starting material used in a synthetic route here. Um, so the aim was to observe the impurities in both chemical ionization and electron ionization to determine formulae of the impurities. So here is the total ion chromatogram in electron ionization. These impurities that we've um, identified can be assigned to structures um, that have been formed during the manufacture. Um, many of these impurities uh, were confirmed using um, like a, a live research, for example, in this database. And here for you is a, a zoomed total ion chromatogram as well, just so you can see it a little better. So I know this next slide is uh, a bit of a busy one, but if I break it down for you. So you've got your attention times in the furthest left column and the assignment that we've gone from there. So not only have we been able to assign the formula to start with, but we've matched in the NIST library to structures as well. So the middle section almost is the electron ionization data with its uh, mass accuracy, and then followed by the chemical ionization with its mass accuracy. And across the whole table, the highest mass accuracy we've seen is at 1.1 ppm. So all of this has given certainty almost and confidence in the formula that we've, um, that we've decided to look at. And with the help of the NIST library, we've been able to match um, match the structures. So an example of us using the NIST library is here. Um, so we used the NIST um, to search which was in the tail of the main peak. Um, and if I can just draw your attention to the bottom right corner, you've got the mirrored plot. And I know Kyle showed something similar. So our spectra that we've produced is along the top while the NIST library is along the bottom. And based on the absence and presence of different fragment ions within your, within your spectra there, it matches to a high probability. And so you can see the high probability in the top search there. And this, is, um, this matches what we can find in like, the manufacturing process, what could be expected to be formed. And so we identify from there. Um, we also did uh, another linearity experiment, just on another molecule, just to give it a go. Um, this was the diamine sample again, and over a range of concentrations that you can see tabulated there. 
we extract, uh, used extracted iron, which were then plotted against the concentrations, um, which gave the linearity plot shown next. So this produced a linear response with an R squared value of 0 0.9996, again, meeting our internal set, uh, set specs. Um, and each of these points, again, just to stress, the mass accuracy was less than 1.1 part per million. So in summary, the q active GC has been evaluated for qualitative and quantitative analysis. It all ha also has the potential to offer increased capability for impurity detection. We've used both EI and CI and looked how both of those can be a powerful tool for helping as well. We've looked at the ease of usability, looking at the setup of the instrument. And so the speed and the efficiency of the QExactive GC MS system gives confidence in impurity identification, with one elemental formula being identified. Um, so thank you very much, and I'll pass back. Thank you, Carl and, and Natalie, for um, a very interesting and enjoyable presentation. Now let's move on to the last part of today's webinar, the question and answer session. Please submit any further questions by clicking on the Ask a Question button at the bottom of your screen. So we've got lots of great questions, so thank you for that. Um, the first question, um, what does the system allow you to use and sorry, does the system allow you to use a solid probe for non-volatile material? Yeah, I can take that. Yes, it does. Uh, the solids probe is um, is available on the system. It allows you to introduce uh, solid or liquid samples um, directly onto a probe tip. That's great. Thanks, Kyle. Um, what else do you need from the system to make it even more appropriate for farmer applications? Um, so looking over the work we've done, um, we didn't quite trial out the MSMS feature, but that would always be a bonus when we're looking at unknown impurities as well. Um, but one of the things that would be more appropriate is working with the NIST library, because um, I know you can develop that further in a sense, because that's not high accurate math and you're comparing to low-resolution data um, to, to get that going a bit more to have the high accurate mass there would be even more confident in the compounds that you're identifying. That's great. Thank you, Natalie. Um, next question. Were there any limitations that you came across when using the system? Um, I don't think there were any major limitations that we came across. We, um, while we trialed, because it was early on in the development of the trace finder, so this is the peak picking deconvolution software, we didn't have, um, because it wasn't in its full commercial set yet, uh, we didn't get to use it to its full capability. So we still used it, and I've shown the NIST library search there, um, but that would be the one thing that potentially we'd, we want to go back and have another look at. Yeah, I should probably add to that that, that AstraZeneca evaluated the system before its launch um, at ASMS 2015 last year. So not all the software tools were, were ready at that point, but they are subsequently released and ready, um, such as the Trace Finder application that I presented. That's great. Thank you both. Um, next question. Where do you see this technology fitting in with APS APIs, sorry, that are in the mass range of more than 500. Um, Carl, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think the, the software, uh, the system itself has a, a high range that so can go up past 500 MOZ. Yeah, absolutely. But we're up over, uh, uh, I believe, 1,200 Daltons capable. But it all depends on the relative volatility because, as I mentioned before, we you can introduce the sample by gas chromatography or by solids probe. Um, so for for polar non-volatile analytes um, above 500, it's not going to give you uh, give you great results. You would need to supplement it with, with LCMS. But for uh, volatile or semi-volatile analytes uh, and impurities, 
um, if they are, if you're able to get them through a GC column, they'd certainly be easily analysable in that mass range. Fantastic, thank you. Were the impurities analysed using a peak identification algorithm? Um, so this is what I mentioned with the trace finder software not being 100% finished by because we uh, we used the system pre-launch. Um, but what we did see of it was quite impressive to the point that you can put in uh, a whole spectra and it'll give you out what it thinks is in there. Great, thank you. Um, next question. We've got lots of fantastic questions, so thank you very much for that. Um, how do you search using accurate mass data on the NIST library, which is predominantly low-resolution data? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the, as, I, as I mentioned, the, the NIST library is just one of the libraries that you could search. So you're able to search any proprietary libraries. We have a number of in-house proprietary libraries that are um, high-resolution, accurate mass-based libraries. There's also web-based libraries such as NZ Cloud that again is a high resolution MS but also substructural MSMS library that is freely searchable um, and you're also able to search your own in-house libraries. Now, if, you, if you only have available to you the nominal mass um, NIST based libraries, what, what you're able to do is, is take the information that you have based on empirical formulae from that library that um, is search based on search index only, so a comparison of, of is the I and there around its nominal mass, but you supplement that with the in, um, high resolution accurate mass elemental composition of each and every fragment iron. So the search is, is based on a nominal mass search if the library is nominal mass, but you're able to confirm on every iron based on the um, accurate mass empirical and elemental composition of, of each fragment. Thank you, Kyle. Um, next question. How much experience is required to use this new GCMS system? Um, well, when I turned up, I'd, I'd never used it before, um, never used uh, a thermo instrument before, to be honest. Um, so I wasn't used to their, their system, their setup, because I know the extractor bite. Um, which is your source swap. I know that's on a few other instruments, um, but the guys kindly um, let me pick up the exact byte and um, swap the source there myself. Um, like we, we swapped the column and it was dead easy um, because there's no venting and stuff. There's almost like a, a middle passage that you can go through so you don't have to vent. So everything's thought with the user in mind. Um, like you're swapping of the heads again, um, because you don't have to do that manually, there's no technical experience you actually need there. You That's great, thank you. Um, next question, we've got, just got time for one more question. So can you use more than one CI gas? Um, in my examples, I use methane gas, but I know there was an option of using ammonia as well. Um, is there any others potentially, Kyle? Uh, well, you, you can use any typical gas for for ionisation. I think the question is more about can you can you introduce multiple gases at the same time with with some form of gas control? Um, and I don't believe we have that capability on the system right now. Um, it is a single a single gas, but you are able to pre mix them um, downstream should you wish, or or use mixed cylinders. Um, but you, you're not. The system doesn't have a, a multiple gas mixing and delivery delivery valve. Thank you. Well, that's all we've got time for today. Thank you very much, Natalie and Kyle, for today's informative discussion and presentation. Thank you to everyone joining us online and for your interesting questions. I hope that you have found this a worthwhile session. If we didn't manage to answer your questions, please feel free to email me at Lois at selectscience.net, so that's L-O-I-S at selectscience.net, and I will follow up with your questions personally. If you would like to listen again to today's webinar or invite a friend to listen, it will be available to watch on demand in the next few days. Goodbye, and thank you once again for joining us.